Hi, welcome to the EEV blog, an electronics engineering video blog of interest to anyone involved in electronics design. I'm your host, Dave Jones. Hi, someone mentioned a while back that I should do a blog on choosing a part or how I go about choosing a part for a typical circuit. Now I've touched on this before with the design merry-go-round using DigiKey and everything else and parametric search engines to find suitable parts, but can I do one in detail? Well, that sounds like a good idea and it just so happens that I'm working on a small little project at the moment where I think this might be an ideal example. So let's see if we can do go through the process of choosing, selecting a suitable part for a single cell DC to DC boost converter. The first thing you do is take a look at your basic requirements. And in this case, it doesn't matter what the product is. Let's just say I want to power my circuit from a single cell, a single alkaline AA, AAA cell, 1.5 volt cell that you're familiar with. So I need a boost converter, and in this case, I want to convert it to 5 volts at a maximum of half an amp. So that is 2.5 watts. Of output power, it doesn't sound like much, V times I, okay, two and a half watts, doesn't sound like much. But to get it from a single cell might be a bit tricky. Now, you've seen this circuit before, it's a basic uh, boost converter circuit that I went through in the DC to DC converter tutorial. So I won't go through it again, but the basic concept is that it has a FET here which stores energy in the inductor, and then the inductor dumps the energy into the output capacitor and that forms a basic boost converter. And this FET here is actually a uh, chip. It's like a single chip solution. And that's what we're gonna look for today. We're gonna try and select, see if we can find out of all the millions of chips out there, a chip that just does this job here for a boost converter. Now, because it's a single cell, okay, the input voltage is gonna vary from 0.8 volts to 1.5 volts. Why does it do that? Well, if you look at the uh, characteristic discharge curve of a typical alkaline cell, it looks something like this. This is voltage of the cell versus time or, or actual discharge time in minutes or hours or you know, days or something like that, depending on the current. And I'll, I'll have to do a separate blog on this, and I will. But basically, uh, the input voltage starts out at 1.5 volts, and then it it diminishes, and it kind of, once it, after it, this little drop at the start, it's kind of sort of linear, probably down to around about a volt. And that's where most of the energy in the battery under that curve is used. But you might want to go down to, say, 0.8 volts, which is deemed to be the typical cutoff uh, point for a, an, a typical alkaline cell. And that's where most of the energy is used. So if you want to get an extra 10 or 20% energy out of it or something like that, you can see after about 0.8 volts it just drops off completely. So ide so your ideal chip for a single cell uh, DC to DC boost converter is to have an input range from 0.8 volts to 1.5 volts. And in this case we need 2.5 watts of output power. Now as you'll see when we go through selecting a device in much more detail, Let's do a basic calculation of how much switching current we need because uh, these DC to DC boost converters are typically rated by their switch peak switch current capability. Now, 0.5 amps on the output, okay, 5 volts at 0.5 amps doesn't mean that our chip needs to be capable of 0.5 amps switching current. No, because this is a boost converter, the input current which goes through here and down through the switch is much much higher than that 0.5 amps and that is going to have a direct relationship to the input voltage because we've got a very low input voltage here of 0.8 volts and we want 5 volts that's out that's quite a step up so therefore this input or switching current down here is going to be much greater than our output current of 0.5 amps. So it's gonna be roughly, here it is, I switch, okay, ISW is approximately equal. I won't go into further details, but this is a rough rule of thumb you can use. V out on V in, five volts on, take our minimum 0.8 volts, times our output current of half an amp is gonna be approximately 3.1 amps or higher, possibly. Or maybe if we want only a one volt cutoff, 
down here, then we could be looking at, you put one volt into here and you're looking at two and a half amps. So we're looking at probably 2.5 amps switching current capability in our DC to DC converter. Remember that for later. Now, if you look at the converters out there, there's probably thousands of different types of DC to DC converters. A lot of them operate at low voltage. So we should have no real problem finding a converter, right? And what are the other requirements? You've got to think about those as well. And it just so happens I have a quick list here. This is just a basic list. It's not complete by any means, but these are some of the things you might want to think about if you're choosing a DC to DC converter like this. First of all, number one by far is the efficiency versus the load current graph, which we'll go into great detail on. And you've got to be careful that's at five volts because they'll have different curves for this in the data sheet for different uh, output voltages. Trap for young players, big one. The minimum input voltage, of course, very important. Tick, we need that because we need to go down to at least a volt. Maybe get away with 1.1 volts minimum input voltage. I don't know, but that's very important. So we have to care about that one. It's going to be one of our top requirements. The minimum startup voltage, because while the chip might go down to, say, 0.8 volts, might operate down to that, it might not start up at that. So if your battery is very low and, it, and you try to start up your circuit, boom, it may not do it. And that will change with the load as well. So that might be important. In this case, for my particular project, not that important because I expect to start up the battery at 1.5 volts and then just continuously drain it all the way down. But for your uh, particular requirements, it may be a big deal. Cost availability, always an issue. Can you get the damn thing? Is it a 40 week lead time? Is it 20 bucks a chip or is it $2 or 20 cents a chip? It matters. Um, the component count, because these DC to DC converters, some will have a built-in switch, a built-in FET switch, some will have a built-in diode, and that minimizes the number of external components you've got to have. So that might come into account here. Um, what's the shutdown current? Because it's battery operated. Do you want to just be able to switch this thing off and then the battery can last for a year or five years in standby? So that might be important as well. Uh, what's the footprint size? Is it a big monster footprint? Is it hard to solder? Do you need to hand solder it? Uh, what frequency does it, and what frequency do, does it operate? And that goes into the size of the inductor you need. No point having a little tiny little DC to DC converter chip if you need a massive, big, huge, whopping and expensive inductor. So frequency and f an overall footprint size, not just the chip. Um, does it have a power good output? I don't know, that might be important. You know, do you want to know if your DC to DC converter is powered up properly or not and, and actually regulating the output voltage? The noise, the switching noise, is that important? For my application, no, not really. Uh, the reference voltage stability over temperature, is that a problem? My one, I don't really care that much. It's not that critical, but for your application, it might. Uh, transient response, do you have big loads going boom, 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 you know, in and out? That could be important, and that's not the end of the list. So there you go, there's a lot to think about. That's just one component in our entire design just for the power supply. It's unbelievable. And you have to go through, through similar things in your design cycle for other, um, for all the, well, a lot of the other components in your design as well. It's crazy. Okay, here we go. Now, how do we find a part like this DC to DC converter? Well, I've mentioned this before, it's to use what's called a parametric search. Now, uh, all, most of the manufacturer's websites will have parametric search, but because we don't know which manufacturer we want to use at the moment, we're going to use one of the component suppliers like DigiKey here. So I've opened up the DigiKey website, and we're going to search for our DC to DC converter. Now, let's try it. DC Yep. Let's try it. DC converter. And let's see what we get. Here we go. Now, it's under integrated circuits down here and typically you can tell what you want because it'll have the most number. In this case, 17,000 items down here switching DC to DC converters. That's what we want. So we'll click on that. 
and here we are inside our DC to DC converter parametric search now we can scroll across like this and you can see all the parameters we've got things like package in package in package case mounting type operating temp power output which we'll be using because we know we want 1.2 uh, 2.5 watts if, if you remember that from the calculations so we can choose those voltage inputs very important so we'll be using that one switching frequency not so much we're not caring too much about the efficiency at the moment except for the fact that obviously we want uh, the device to have as higher efficiency as possible because then there's uh, that minimizes the waste from our battery our current output will be using our voltage output we might be using that but because most of these DC to DC converters are adjustable we might might not um, touch the output number of outputs we only need one whether or not we want in an internal FET switch here we might use that uh, the type of converter we'll definitely be using and the manufacturer now here's a tip if you don't know who manufactures uh, various devices then you can use a supplier like this to find like which manufacturers we actually that actually manufacture these type of converters so as you can see analog devices very uh, diodes Inc um, XR Fairchild Freescale they're all there all the big names linear tech Maxim Micrel microchip Nat semi on semi NXP etc etc they're all there and these are Texas instruments and these are the ones we can go to to use this list to go to the individual manufacturers website but let's get down to it now because we know that we want to uh, only look at um, a boost converter we want a step up here it is step up boost converter we're not worried about cuck or flyback I won't go into those we just want a standard step up boost converter so we select that and we go apply filter and bingo it is now only showing uh, all of these manufacturers who manufacture boost converters and it's um, we we're using this to eventually narrow down to the part we want now let's go for uh, the output power shall we because we know we want 2.5 uh, watts basically now we could go uh, current output like this we could actually scroll down here and um, but current output is a bit deceptive because and uh, because as I said you don't know um, these chips are designed for over a very wide input voltage range so the output current might it might be able to deliver 2.5 amps for example but it might be it might not be able to do that at a very low input voltage and we'll go into that we'll find out all that sort of stuff from the data sheets later so let's clear that we we don't want that item there and we only want to look at power output let's see what chips are available in our power output range let's let's be generous and go one and a half watts you can hold down the shift key and let's go up to well 3.3 .3 watts that's the maximum okay apply filter and we've found um, it's selected 166 items across seven pages now we can narrow them down to in stock but I'm not too fussed if they're in stock at DigiKey or not at this particular uh, stage now what we the other thing we need to do is the voltage input there's no point selecting a chip that only has a minimum of say 2.3 volts input like that that's of no use to us at all we want one that at least goes down to one volt or lower so we're going to select one to five there's these whole bunch of these ones up here so adjustable down to 0.7 this one goes down to 0.3 Wow you know that's pretty incredible so we'll choose those and we'll ignore all the rest so we'll apply filter and what have we found we've got now 95 items down here I'm fairly happy with that at the moment as a first pass and you can see our manufacturers have dropped we've only got linear tech Maxim on semi and Texas instruments here are our available manufacturers but I know other ones might be able to do it as well but let's go into our view page shall we and have a look down here now DigiKey have a sort by price option because price is always you know price is always an option when you want to do these sort of things so we can sort from lowest to highest in um, ascending order 
we won't worry about in stock but let's get the one-off price shall we so sort by price ascending one-off price and it reorders it like that two dollar this first one up here there's ten thousand available two dollars ninety eight in one-off quantity that's quite reasonable and it's a TPS it's a Texas Instruments part I don't mind their parts at all it's a TPS 61028 device um, that one certainly rings a bell and uh, it's got an output current of up to 800 milliamps but we'll go into that now the switching frequency we're not too worried about at the moment but the higher the switching frequency the greater the uh, well the smaller the inductor you need because that's important as well this design is um, going to be fairly small so uh, a higher frequency giving us a smaller inductor uh, will help a lot now the maximum power outputs only 2.05 watts here but I'm going to give this device a go I'm not too fussed about the packaging um, for this particular project so let's go in and check out this device here it is here let's have a look at the data sheet and here we go we've got the this TI devices part open and once which is uh, fairly common for a lot of these devices as you can see it's the same data sheet for many different types of chips so when you're looking through the data sheet just keep that in mind that uh, these devices are different and they will have different graphs in there they'll have different parameters and specs and all sorts of things so just be careful about what actual part number you are referring to now this one sounds pretty good 96 percent efficient synchronous boost converter 96 <laughs> percent right sounds very impressive but we'll go into the detail shall we um, device quiescent current I'm not too fussed about how much um, current it takes during actual operation not too fussed input voltage range point 0.9 volts great not a problem I'm fairly happy doesn't go down to 0.8 but hey I'm fairly happy with 0.9 anything one or under I'm fairly happy with uh, fixed and adjustable output options that's great we might be able to get a fixed output voltage option which allows us to um, minimize uh, to uh, lower our component count we don't need these two external voltage set resistors which you'll typically use um, ap applications one cell there you go it's it's specifically designed for one cell two cell three cell alkaline so let's see how good this puppy is uh, now as you can see this is an example circuit here and uh, there's one thing you'll notice missing from this circuit where's the diode it's not there so it must actually be built in so this one's fairly handy in that it actually uh, with the built-in diode that lowers uh, your parts count and lowers your component cost so that's that is definitely a good thing so let's scroll down here and really when we when we're looking at a DC to DC converter like this we really want to go down to the guts of it which are the graphs okay so we'll scroll down this is the internal operation of it but we'll scroll down and we will get the characteristic curves let's find them now what we want is aha uh -huh, now we're now we're looking at it we want the efficiency in percentage um, on the y-axis there versus the output current milliamps on the x-axis now as you can see um, this is for the TPS 61020 and VBAT okay is 0.9 volts and that's what we want 0.9 volts as you can see 85 percent efficiency down at 1 milliamp really nice it goes up but look 100 milliamps okay it's still 85 percent efficient awesome pretty happy with that but then it tails off like this and at 200 milliamps um, output voltage ah no look we've been fooled oh dull. look V out equals 1.8 volts okay ah I've been fooled again I do it every time and this is a real trap for young players Th these these characteristic curves are only for V out of 1.8 volts that may so these have no relationship at all to what we want we want 5 volts output so what we need to do um, is find a characteristic curve graph but let's look at this graph over here on the left hand side maximum output current versus input voltage perfect okay our input voltage 0.9 volts down here our V out 5 volts it's got multiple graphs superimposed so let's look at the 5 volt V out graph here and it plummets down like that so at 0.9 
input at 0.9 volts input on out for a 5 volt output it's only going to do about 100 milliamps maybe 150 milliamps or at 1 volt input it might squeeze up to 200 milliamps output but look this chip's a failure right there we simply can't use it now just to prove that uh, let's go down and find an efficiency graph for 5 volts out because it will have continue to have these graphs here we go that's 3.3 and bingo here's V out equals 5 volts for various input uh, voltage levels now as you can see when the input voltage over here the, the higher the input voltage the more output current you can get look at this if the V bat here is 3.6 volts over here if your battery voltage is 3.6 you can go up to 1 amp output current huge okay 5 volts 1 amps that's 5 watts and it still does 90% efficiency it's awesome but the trick is for these low voltage converters once you go down you're looking at this graph here which then tails off completely at 250 milliamps 100 down here to 200 at about 250 there it is it's tailed off completely so this thing is useless and that's just going to continue to plummet to, to nothing right down here so we're, we'd be lucky to get 300 milliamps out of that at V at a 1.2 volt input voltage but we want to go down to 1 volt or lower so this device clearly is not capable of that okay so that TI parts a failure well let's go back the good thing about this is that you can hit the back button here and it goes back to the list and you can hit the back button again and it goes back to your parametric search uh, search you had before and you can just go forward and back and it actually keeps all that info there but let's look at these other devices. We've looked at the Texas Instruments. Now let's look at a Maxim uh, 1947. Let's take a look at that one. Let's open up the data sheet here. Okay, low input output voltage step up DC to DC converter with reset sounds pretty good low input voltage 0.7 volts uh, high 94% efficiency sounds pretty good fixed output voltages 3.3 well um, hopefully it'll go up to 5 but no look at it these devices only go up to 3.3 so this device is a failure straight away and we could have fixed that by uh, sorting our parametric search by output voltage as well, but we'll, we'll just live with that for the time being. Now, I've done looking at the TI parts. I want something else. All right, I found a linear technology part here LTC 3424 I've heard of that one before so let's check it out all oh, 3 megahertz frequency operation 2 amps um, output current sounds sounds great 1.5 watts not quite there but hey let's um because I can overdrive this the uh, there's a little quirk with this design where it really doesn't matter um, if I overdrive it or something like that I'm not too fast so let's go into the LTC 3424 it's a non-stock part but that's not going to stop us we might be able to get it somewhere else and let's take a look at the data sheet shall we 3 megahertz that is a very high frequency uh, boost converter indeed 1.5 volts to 5.5 output voltage excellent 1 amp switch current uh, well we're, we're going to need at least the 2 amp switch current there for the 3424 um, but we might be able to overdrive it's not a problem wide input voltage range 0.5 volts excellent great but what do we want to look at give us the efficiency graphs okay now let's have a look down here the efficiency is these ones down here are for a V out of 1.8 volts that's hopeless a V out of 1.8 ah look over here on the left hand side look at the circuit here this one has two different input voltages notice how pin 6 is a VDD pin 
there and that goes to a higher voltage from 2.7 to 5.5. So this isn't a true single cell device. It actually needs a second um, step up converter to uh, step up our single cell just to drive the VDD of the chip. And well, that's a bit of a showstopper. Um, well, not so much a, sh a showstopper. We might have to resort to using this device. So let's, let's not count it out yet. Let's go check out the input graph, uh, the efficiency graph, sorry. Let's go and find it for efficiency graph. Converter 1.2 to 1.8. No, we want 5 volts. Give us the 5 volt converter graph. It doesn't have one. Look at that. No, it doesn't have a 5 volt output graph. So that's pretty useless, this device. No, it doesn't have a parametric curves for 5 volt output not impressed at all so i'm going to rule this one out because it just doesn't have the information that's easily got um, from the graphs because we want to know the typical performance of this thing um, and quite frankly if it doesn't have a parametric graph i'm not going to use it i might use it as a last resort if i have to go in there and calculate it or measure it but i don't want to do that right now i'm looking for devices now, let's check out a Maxim device down here, Maxim 1765. Let's open the data sheet. Okay, now this Maxim device is only an 800 milliamp step up DC to DC converter, but it's got a 500 milliamp linear regulator, so who knows, this might be good. Um, adjustable output from 2.5 to 5.5, up to 800 milliamps output. Uh, let's have a look at its parametric graphs. Okay, here we go. Efficiency versus load current for V out, the one in the middle here. Uh, v out plus 5 volts. Now, let's take a look. V in at 1.2. Now, it has different modes of operation. You can see here that um, there's actually a normal mode and there's a PWM mode as well. So, uh, the, basically, the normal mode modes, they will allow greater efficiency at very low or almost no load currents. But um, I don't need that for my circuit. I just need it to work in PWM mode at a fairly high, you know, a couple hundred milliamps up to the 500 milliamp maximum. So, we're looking at those black curves there and we're looking at Vn equals uh, plus 1.2 volts. Now uh, the load current we're looking at here is uh, now I'm looking at these graphs here and something doesn't seem right. This one efficiency versus load current for V out 5 volts this is what we want. Now this is these are the typical characteristic curves you get but look at this for Vn 1.2 volts it's saying it's this bottom curve here and if we follow that curve up it shows that it's this big one which goes right out here to about seven or eight hundred milliamps that's crazy it seems almost as if it's back to front and this v in at plus 3.6 volts back here is this curve here and it cuts out there at 200 milliamps output current. It's back to front. I reckon they've screwed that up. If we look at the one on the right, on the left hand side here, efficiency versus load currents, exactly the same parametric graph, but for plus 3.3 volts out, look, this is what you'd expect. V in at plus 1.2 is this graph, the bottom one here, which comes short and stops short like that. That's what you'd expect. And you'd expect the same thing over here on this uh, on this graph on the right here, but I think they've actually, this is a data sheet mistake. I believe it is. They've actually labelled this one down the bottom here, that label down there should be plus 1.2. And this one in the middle, they've got right at 2.4. And this one here, that it extends all the way out to 700 milliamps or so, should be plus 3.6 volts. Ah, Maxim, you've got your damn graph wrong. But these are the things you've got to watch out for. 
So that's a real interesting dilemma. If you didn't have the experience to know that uh, what these graphs should typically do and know what to expect from them and you read straight off this graph you'd be reading the wrong data and you're designing that part into your prototype and the damn thing wouldn't work so data sheets are not infallible you've got to watch out for them and in this case the good thing is we have another the same graph here on the uh, left hand side exactly the same uh, parametric result here and look efficiency in percent They've got 1% up here from 0 to 1. It's crazy. What's going on here? That's hilarious. It looks like Maxim have completely screwed up this data sheet. Totally balls it up. But these sort of things happen. And you've got to keep your wits about you. And you've got to uh, know what to expect from these things. Don't take the data at face value. Always ask yourself, is this the expected result? Are these graphs what you would expect? How do they compare with other manufacturers' data sheets and so forth? And a dead giveaway that they've actually got it wrong is, as you can see, it's this one is labeled V in plus 1.2 volts and it overlays with this particular graph here. So if you go down there, they've, it, they've clearly labeled it incorrectly because these are supposed to match up at the high end and deviate at the low end. So the labels are a clear giveaway that's incorrect. Back here at our parametric search page, we've got one device down here right down the bottom from On Semiconductor. I really like On Semi. So let's check out their part, the NCP1422. Let's go in, call for the price. It doesn't give you the price at all, but that's not going to stop us. Let's take a look at the data sheet and see what this baby's got. And here it is, 800 milliamps, synchronous rectifier, but as I said, you can't take that 800 milliamps at face value because, okay, we need 500 milliamps on our output and you think this one will balls it in easy with 800 milliamps. Well, I think we'll find that that's not the case. Now let's go down and try and find the parametric graph again. And here we go, we've found the efficiency versus load current, exactly what we want. Now we want the output voltage, this is the one on the right hand side here is V out equals 3.3, that's not the graph we want, we want this one, V out equals 5 volts. And notice also that they actually give you the uh, typical values that these were measured at, so it gives you an inductance value of 6.8 microhenries, C in and C out values as well. So these parametric graphs will change with all of your circuit parameters as well. So you, we're really only taking these as a guide at this stage, a rough you know, ballpark um, uh, type thing to see if we can use this device. But it will actually require either further calculation, further looking into the, um, the parameters of the data sheet and building up the prototype and actually measuring it before we can actually make a call on any individual device. Now, this one only has a V in of 1.5 volts. So really, that's not helping us much. Now, if we go down here, there's a V out equals 1.8 with a V in of 1.2, but they don't have really the, uh, the, the curve we want on this characteristic graph. We'd, I'd like to see it down at 1.2 volts or, or 1 volt or even lower. What does it actually do? But So we're stuck with the 1.5, but even at the 1.5, look, uh, it's only going to do 100, 200, it's only going to do 300 milliamps at 5 volts, at 1.5 volts. And you know that it's actually going to be worse than that at lower voltages. You'll have a curve that'll go something like that and then drop off much earlier at 1.2. So this one's a clear loser. So we've exhausted the parts we found on a first pass here for DigiKey. Now let's actually go back, we'll scroll back through these parametric uh, search and we'll take out the, uh, the power output which we had because sometimes they don't specify it, okay? The power output here is not specified at all. So we'll actually reset that. Now let's go for say the output current. Let's try and use this as a search parameter, shall we? Now, 
Now, this is a trap because, as I said, if you thought that the output current was only 500 milliamps capable, then really, you know, you're not going to find the devices you want in that region because the switch current uh, is going to have to be much larger than that. But let's choose 500 milliamps anyway. No, actually, we'll, we'll start at 1 amp and we'll go up to, say, 10 amps. That's pretty extreme, but let's try it out. Apply filter and bingo, we've searched. And once again, the voltage input is a really key requirement. So we must have that. But let's stretch it a little bit. Let's stretch it and say VN 1.2 volts, say. Let's, let's be fairly generous because it might operate a bit below that. The parametric search data could be wrong. You don't know. So let's narrow that down. And bingo, look at the manufacturers. We've got diodes, ink. We've got Micrel. I, I like Micrel parts. Um, we've got Torex Semiconductor, some of the smaller players, Semtech. So let's take a look at those parts. There's 173 items down there, and let's go into View Page. And once again, we'll sort by price, shall we? Price is always a good indicator to uh, search and to do a first pass search on. So. As you can see, a dollar thirty-five each in one-off quantities. So they're going to be really cheap. And these are tiny little devices. Look at this Torex device down here. Um, it's got a one-amp um, output capability, anywhere from uh, 1.8 volts to 5.3 volts output, 0.8 volts to 6 volts input. Let's take a look at this. Let's see what Torex can do. The good thing about DigiKey is that it just allows you to jump straight to the data sheets, and you don't have to go to the manufacturer's website. Bingo, they pop open. When I was a boy, you had to have, you know, uh, bookshelves full of these data books, and they're the only devices you could use. But anyway, let's not go there. Let's see what this Torex device has to do. Now, output current. Oh, no, we don't want that. Bit of a fail there. Okay, now, down here it shows that we've got 500 milliamps output. It's capable of at output of 3.3 volts at a VIN of 1.8. Uh, it's really not going to do it um, because we just know from experience looking at the other graphs that it just gets worse with A, a lower input voltage, and B, a higher output voltage. That differential between V in and V out, when that gets wider, you know the current capability is going to drop. That's why, um, oh, we failed again. That's why this one here. That has when V in drops to 0.9 volts and it's got a greater V in to V out range, the max output current's only 150 milliamps. So that's no good at all. But let's go have a look at the characteristic curves anyway. Output voltage 3 volts. Ah, oh, no, we're it's no. Let's not bother. This sucker's just not going to do the job. So we're back at our DigiKey search here, and well, that price thing didn't work out. Let's search by output current, shall we? Uh, here it is, output current uh, column, let's sort downwards. So, descend in order, max output current of 5 amps. <laughs> now we're talking, right? Linear technology, look, this looks like a big pin count uh, package, so it's probably a uh, multi-channel converter or something like that, but it's input voltage 0.5. Um, so, let's go check that one out, shall we? It's $5.36 for one-off, which I guess isn't too bad. LTC 3425. And yes, I was right. It's a four-phase synchronous step-up converter. So that means it needs four inductors. If we go down here to the circuit, there it is. Four different inductors. So that takes up a lot of board space, but that will definitely get you um, the extra, the, the, the efficiency is much better with these multi-phase devices. So you might have to sacrifice board space for uh, output uh, current capability. So let's keep this one in mind. Even though I don't have much board space, I'm going to keep an open mind. And this one is for a V out of 3.3. So no, I don't like that at all. Let's go down and find. Bang. As you can see, we ignore all this all of this data here, all these specs, we just ignore them and we go straight to the bottom line of the efficiency graph. Here we go. Converter efficiency for V out at 5 volts. And as you can see, V in, ah, oh, look, it only gives you a minimum V in of 2.4.
That's useless. I want to go down to one volt. So it looks like this thing just doesn't give us the data that we want. V out at five volts, discontinuous mode, forced mode, oh, gets all messy. Um, and uh, converter uh, input current microamps, no, let's, no, it just, it's not really going to have what we want. Ah, so let's, this is another one, which, another graph, we can get the maximum output current in uh, burst mode operation, V out equals five volts at versus V in output current, V in, and as you can see at five volts at V in of one volt, it only does 50 milliamps. God, what a wimp. And let's just keep going through the list because this is what you have to do typically to find devices like this. You might get one that you like first go, but this is a bit more of an obscure application to go from a true single cell up to a 5 volt output at uh, 2.5 watts is actually quite a demanding application. So let's check out this LM2623. Let's look at the data sheet. General purpose, gated, oscillator, DC to DC converter. Boom, I don't care. Let's go down to the parametric graph. And this one, as you can see, needs an external diode on it. Let's go down and try and find these graphs. Here we go. Efficiency versus V in. Exactly what we want. For V out, 5 volts. Bingo, no problems at all. V in. Oh, as you can see, these graphs do change from manufacturer to manufacturer. They're not always the same. This is actually uh, versus V in. So this one at 600 milliamps, it doesn't really have the 500 milliamps we want, but we can sort of guess that the 500 milliamps is sort of going to be, well, there, there's the 300 milliamp one. So, and that's the 600. So you can guess 500. Let's just split it down the middle like that and say 500 goes down there like that. And the problem is with this device, it only has, goes down to a V in of 1.8. So that's no good at all. This graph, you, you don't know whether or not these things just gently go down like that or whether they tail off really quickly. So in, in the case of the 600 milliamp, you can see it really tails off very quickly and that's just going to plummet like that. So really this one doesn't have the graph we need to, uh, to determine if this device is suitable or not. So, this one's scrapped too. All right, I'm sick of using DigiKey. It just hasn't produced what I want in this particular instance. So, let's choose one of those manufacturers. TI uh, makes some really good converters. So, let's go to the TI website and let's go down here to the power management. There it is. And Bingo, let's try and this list over here, different types of switching regulators. As you can see, step down, step up. There's 90 of them. They have 90 different step up regulators. Surely we can find a regulator in here from 90 of them. Oh, check this out. The good thing about Texas Instruments, look at this. They have a specific checkbox for one cell, uh, sorry, one cell alkaline nickel metal hydride input. So let's tick that. They're doing our hard work for us. It automatically refreshes the table. We don't have to do anything else. Look, we can type in the input voltage here and do better, better parametric search, but let's search for a true one cell capable um, alkaline converter. And bingo, these are the ones we've got here. The TPS 61026, that's what we looked at before originally. Here it is. You remember this? The uh, Texas Instruments data sheet we had, the 61026. So it looks like that's pretty much the only device um, they've got that will actually do it. There's another one here, the TPS61220 uh, series, which is that part of this one over here, 22, no. So we can probably um, take a look at this one. And here it is. We've got the TPS61220, and let's take a look at the data sheet. Let's not muck around. Waiting for the internet can be a real bitch. There we go. And we're up. Right, I don't care about the rest of the crap up the top. Just give me the graph. That's all I want, really. Oh, efficiency versus output current and input voltage. Oh, check out this. It's even in color. Isn't that neat? Let's see if we can make heads or tails 
out of this one. Now the input voltage up here, it does go to 0.8. So that's brilliant. I love that. But this, ah, look, there's the trap. Trap for young players, V out, 3.3 volts. That's no good at all. Let's see if we can find the graph down here, similar one, for the 5 volts, which is what we want. V out 1.8. Here we go. We've got it. Efficiency and versus output current and input voltage. Okay, now we're talking V in of 0.7 volts. Excellent. Ah, this is a real wimpy device. Look at this. It's got output current at 0.7 volts. Only goes to ah, 25 milliamps. Useless. Nah, this really isn't going to cut it. Even at a V in of 1.2, we're only talking at nah, we're to all we're talking sub 100 milliamps. Useless. Scrapped. Alright, so we've done our dash at TI. Let's check out microchip, shall we? Because microchip are highly underrated when they come, when it comes to analog uh, parts. I've mentioned this before, they're very, very cheap, and they're really quite good performance. So let's check out their power management. One's down here, we're switching regulators. Microchip, here we go. It jumps up with the parametric table. Really nice. Now, what we want is input voltage range here. So we want to sort here from low to high. So there we go. They do make ones. It looks like they only make uh, the MCP 16, uh, 1623, 1624, and 1640 range, which goes down to a low enough voltage for our particular use. Uh, now let's check out the output current milliamps. Well, this one only goes to 350. That's the beefiest one they've got. But uh, let's check it out anyway, just for fun. And let's load up the data sheet. And here we go, the MCP1640. It's quite a nice device. It's only a small footprint. And... Typical converter for 3.3 volts out. Nah. Give us the real graph. I want 5 volts. Thank you. Okay, here we go. 5 volts out. PFM or PWM mode. As we've mentioned before, uh, PFM mode allows you greater efficiency at lower currents. So we're looking at the dashed PWM only mode here. V in at 1.2 is the lower graph. It goes up and starts to drop off and the graph ends at about 100 milliamps for 5 volts out. So we're about five times short. Oh well. And let's try National Semiconductor because they're big in the uh, converter market. So let's go down and have a look at their boost converters down here. Convenient link on the front page here. And they've got this like Java sort of app which ugh, I don't know. Don't really don't really like it. It's a bit of a bit of a pain in the ass. But here we go. Minimum input voltage. Okay, we're looking at one point, let's change the slider here. At, it's a bit tricky, but let's go to 0.99. Actually, let's be generous. Let's type it in 1.2. Let's hit go. And look, they've only got two devices, LM2621 and LM2623. So that's no good at all. We've already looked at the LM2623. That's the best they had, and it wasn't suitable. And we can't stop there. Let's try linear technology. They make some of the best devices in the business. So let's go to power management. Let's go to switching regulators. Let's go to step up regulators. And let's see what they can do for us. Let's go down here. Let's not worry about all this quick search. I don't really like the uh, linear tech thing they've got down here. It's a bit confusing. Let's go to view all products, view table down here. And we'll sort it out for ourselves rather than their, use their silly little tool. We'll go V in minimum, okay, so we're looking at, um, let's sort that column there, the V in column, and as you can see, they've got quite a few devices which go down to 1.2 volts here. The, look at them, there's a whole bunch of them, so we're going to have to check these out, but let's also look at the switch current. Now, let's uh, look at the switch currents for, well, 180 amps is just insane, but let's go for say anywhere from say one and a half amps to there so let's update that and 
Bingo, we've still got a ton of devices, which actually, oh, sorry, no, we have to go uh, VN minimum. So let's go VN 1.2. It, it cleared the previous uh, thing we had. And bingo, we've narrowed down our devices to these ones here. Now, let's take a look at, uh, they all do VN minimum 1 volt. That might be good enough. V out, uh, VN max 10, switch current 3 amps. That's what we're talking about. Um, so in an SO8 package, let's take a look at the LT1308. And here you go, 5 volts at 1 amp from a single lithium ion cell. Now we're talking, we've only got an alkaline uh, cell, so maybe it won't do the 500 milliamps we're after, but hey, this, is, this sounds like it might, certainly might be in the ballpark. So let's open up the data sheet. Okay, let's not muck around. Let's go straight down to the graph, which is what we want. Although they've got one here for... It doesn't tell you what the V-out is. No, it doesn't tell you on that graph. What's the point of that if they don't tell you what the V-out voltage is? Crazy. Or I can't see it there. I must be blind. Anyway, let's go down and find the proper graph down here. Here we go. 5 volts output efficiency. Let's take a look at this baby. What can, it, what can it do for us? 1.5 volts input voltage. Ah, it drops out at 100, 200, 250 milliamps. Wah, fail. And that looks like that was the best device that linear technology had. Because if you go back and look at the... Why do I have to click resend there? It's crazy. If you look at the ones that we had, that had the biggest uh, switch current capability. So that's going to be the best device out of all these. These ones won't be able to touch it, but if you want to go, we can look at the 3539 just as a quick little aside, but you know because the switch current isn't as large that it's pretty much not going to do it, but hey, it might be a little bit more optimized, so let's give it the benefit of the doubt, shall we? And we'll go down here and the efficiency low current at V out 1.8, 3.3, there must be another one here, 5 volts, there it is. Our friend, the 5 volt efficiency versus low current graph. Now, for V in, it's only got V in of 2.4. Once again, that's a fail because it doesn't um, give us any data that we can use to actually uh, to see if this device is suitable at um, you know at uh, at low input voltages. So the efficiency here. At VN 2.4 at 2.4 volts, yeah, it doesn't amp. But what does it do here? I don't want to have to buy the chip, build it up, and then actually measure these graphs myself. What a pain in the ass! So I'm going to give linear technology the flick. Well, we're starting to get a bit slim pickings now, but let's go to Maxim and see what Maxim have. You know about Maxim's lead times? I've bitched about them before and their availability, but they do make a hell of a lot of uh, devices and they make a hell of a lot of uh, power regulators and switching converters and stuff like that. So let's go into power and battery management. They make 1,769 different power management devices. It's crazy. And this is one of the problems why Maxim can't actually supply their devices because they don't have enough factories to churn out the things because they've got, you know, 20,000 different parts or something. It's crazy. Anyway, rant over. DC to DC, switching regulators, step up. There's 89. They make 89 different step up converter chips, and that's fantastic for us. So let's go in. V in, minimum. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. And it, this is, I like Maxim because, as you can see, as I slide this um, slider down here, it tells me fewer and fewer parts are available. So let's go 1.2 volts and under. We've got 31 parts out of the total of 87 up here. So it, it tells you, I, I, I like it. It's a pretty good uh, sorting capability. It's got all the info you want there right in front of you. Now, let's uh, maximum I.O. Let's go the minimum. It's got to be greater than, let's say, 1.5 amps. Bingo. We're down to four parts. There you go. Once you start sorting these parameters down, it comes down pretty quickly. 
now the Max 7, 1708, 1763, 1709, 1703. Um, this one down here, the 1703, one cell to three cell, high power. Oh, 1.5 amps, here we go. This might be a winner. Let's check it out. Well, let's hope it is. It's in an SOIC 16 package, so that tells me that it's reasonably higher power than some of the other um, packages we've been looking at. Um, it's it's certainly a little bit bigger, so let's go down to the Max 1703. One cell. Ah, oh, look at it pop up. God, no! I do not want it. Yeah, you may be selected to take part in customer satisfaction survey. No, go away. God. No thanks. Should the button should be called piss off, not no thanks. Anyway, let's not muck around. Um, well, no, I just noticed uh, something down here. It's 140 milli, 75 milliohm N-channel MOSFET switch, two amps. That's pretty nice. So let's download the data sheet and take a look at the Maxim 1703. And once again, let's not muck around. Let's go down to our Parametric graph down here and efficiency versus low current at V out 5 volts on the left hand side here. Now, uh, V in 1.2 volts. Now, let's look at this one. Uh, as you can see, it's look, it's getting up there 100, 200, 300, 400. Oh, look, it's going to do it. The graph actually stops at about 350 milliamps, uh, sorry, 450 milliamps. So it's all that graph almost goes to 500. If you extrapolate that graph, this one here is the one we're talking about. If you extrapolate that down a little bit further, it's going to plummet at 500 milliamps here. It's going to be about still about maybe 65% to 70% efficient at a VIN of 1.2 volts at 500 milliamps. I think we've found a winner. It's a shame that it doesn't have a lower um, input voltage graph, but, you know, 1.1 volts isn't much lower than 1.2, so you can sort of, you know, guesstimate where the graph is going to be. And the efficiency, well, it might be down at 50% at 1 volt input. You don't know. You'd have to actually measure it. But it looks like, after all that searching, we've finally found a chip that actually looks like it might do what we want. It certainly looks like it's capable of getting 500 milliamps out of it, or pretty close to it, for a good part of the input battery range. And that's what we want. Even though, um, because once you get down to one volt, that's, you know, the lower sort of 30% uh, of the battery capacity or something like that. But the majority of the battery capacity uh, will occur at greater than 1.2 volts. And if we use a lithium uh, double A cell instead of an alkaline, alkaline cell, then we'll get even better performance again. So this one looks like it's going to do the job. So the Max 1703, I think we might have a winner here. So let's go over to DigiKey and go Max 1703. And once again, we didn't see that Max 1703 in our parametric searches on DigiKey. So we had to go, this is an example of how you have to go direct to the manufacturer's website um, often to actually find these parts. You can't just rely on the uh, on the supplier like DigiKey and their search capability. So let's go down here. It's found it. Uh, do they have them in stock? Yes, they've got them in stock, quantity available, 852. That's reasonable, but look at the unit price. Oh, 12 bucks and 10 cents and 9 cents for one chip. Jeez. Ah. Oh. God, you can buy a rocket for 12 bucks. Fly to the moon with that. It's crazy. But the, the 100 of price down here, oh, $5.48 at even 100 of price. And if we go back to Maxim here, and they should have a typical, that's a DigiKey price. If we look at Maxim, they'll have a typical price. Here it is down here. There it is. It's $3.29 at 1K quantity. So you can buy them directly from Maxim. They do sell them sell, sell them themselves direct, I believe. So you should be able to get them for three dollars twenty nine. Bit more expensive than I wanted, but certainly not out of the ballpark. So I like it. The Max seventeen oh three. I'm going to call that one a tentative winner. But of course, that's not the end of it. Let's 
take a look through the data sheet a bit further and let's uh, look at some other stuff. Here's an interesting one, startup voltage versus load current. Now, this is important because if your converter can't start up, then you've got a real problem. Now, um, due to the nature of this design, I don't actually expect it to start up at low uh, battery voltages. I expect it to start up with a fresh cell and that's it. It'll just use up all the cell and it shouldn't have a requirement to start up at low voltage. So this is interesting. Start up voltage on the y-axis versus load current on the x-axis down here. So let's look at 1.5. Smack in the middle there. The start up current, it looks like at 1.5 volts, it can do 200, 300 milliamps. So anything greater than 300 milliamps uh, load current, it's not going to be able to start up. So really, that's required. That's dependent upon um, that's that that might be pushing it for the design I'll have to actually try it out practically and see if it works because if the load comes on instant which it may not with this device um, in fact you can use it in a mode where the um, output isn't loaded until such time as you plug it in so the regulator would start up first and then you can plug it in so it shouldn't be too much of a problem Let's have a look at some other stuff. This uh, peak inductor current limit versus output voltage for PWM mode. That's uh, quite interesting. An output voltage of 5 volts. It's about 2.7 uh, amps uh, output current limit. So this chip, it looks like it actually has uh, current limiting um, capability, uh, basically. So that um, might be a potential trap if we try and use it um, in, um, in, in an actual circuit where we're trying to maybe overpower the thing or, you know, uh, uh, over, over spec the thing. So it might actually shut down on us. So we just have to be careful of that. And we'll have to actually try this chip out in a, um, mock-up prototype first, just to make sure it can do the job. Now, of course, I know what you're thinking. There's more than one uh, component manufacturer out there. So let's try Mouser, shall we? DC converter. Let's type that into Mouser and see what sort of parametric search it has. So semiconductors down here. We want 3,666 devices. There we go. Power management ICs. That's what we want. And let's go to DC to DC switching converters. 1,544, because you want the converters instead of the controllers. Just watch out for that there. Normally, those controllers are normally used in higher power systems um, that have more, more discrete components, external uh, FETs and things like that. So we want uh, switching all-in-one switching converters. So let's go down into there and wow, look at the parametric search they got. It's hardly anything. It's hopeless. It, it, I don't think it used to be like this. Has something changed in Mouser? But all they got is through hole and SMD and case and packaging. You know, you've got to be kidding me. So let's go to the through hole. Uh, sorry, the um, SMD devices. But look, it just doesn't work. It's hopeless. What's the point of that parametric search at all? Just none. So we can limit products to manufacturers, which is quite good. Um, but really, I mean, God. Let's go down to Maxim products down here and select manufacturer. And once again, it still hasn't given us the parametric search we need. So Mouser is absolutely hopeless for DC to DC converters compared to DigiKey. Mouser can be great for other stuff I found, but in this case, it's next to useless. Unless you're searching for a price, which we'll search for our Max 1703 here. We'll type that into Mouser and we'll get, um, yeah, they've got 215 in stock. That was $16 for a one-off, um, $7.88 for 100 So that's pretty much all it's good for. So there you go. I did actually search uh, many other manufacturers as well. I used their parametric searches directly on their sites and I couldn't find anything. The best, the closest device I could find is the Maxim Max 1703 device here, which looks like it will get fairly close to my requirements, but I have to build it up and find out. But these parametric searches usually, uh, you'll usually get like uh, three, four, five devices turn up that will suit your particular requirements. You might even have more. It's, 
it's fairly rare to get down to one device which is your only choice um because uh, if you've got three four five devices available then you choose the one with the lowest price the best availability the best footprint or the best features which have you know might have some stuff built in you might need yada 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 but um the best i could do here is the max 1703 now i also search for devices with external fets as well and i still couldn't find anything um suitable so there are two other options left either apart from use the max 1703 which i am going to try out i'll i'll uh, breadboard that up and see what it's like the other option is to actually get multiple dc to dc converters like this and actually put them in parallel and then sum them at their um diode uh the actual cathode of the diode here but that's a bit tricky because then you how do you equally share uh load across uh, across the various regulators and but it might turn out because this max 1703 is quite expensive so it might turn out that um it might be more cost beneficial to use five of those little cheap microchip devices at you know 40 cents each or something like that five of those with uh but then you're going to need five diodes and you know five inductors and stuff like that takes up more room but hey, it might be more cost effective. So if your design is cost driven, you might look down that avenue. But um, I'm not so necessarily cost driven in this respect um, that I'd have to resort to paralleling DC to DC converters, which is a pretty tricky business. You've, um, it's quite hard to share power across these converters. They can upset each other and one hogs all the current and that just gets really nasty. And the third option would be to uh, roll my own DC to DC converter um, but really I don't want to go there I haven't got the time nor the enthusiasm to dick around and try and do that sort of stuff so I think there you go I'll just buy the max 1703 and suck it and see so there you go I hope that was uh, interesting that this is a typical design example uh, where it was actually quite hard and even though I might have compressed this into I don't know 20 or 30 minutes however long I've been going um, I've actually spent much much longer looking through all these data sheets trying to find all this stuff it's crazy and this is just for one part for a simple step up DC to DC converter you can see how much works involved but this is what a typical design engineer would do a lot of the time they're just looking through data sheets parametric searches trying to find suitable parts. So good luck when you're trying to do this. See you next time.